Well, we've been talking about the great sovereignty of God here on Vintage Truth. And listen, this is a doctrine, a portion of theology, a truth about our great God that, that really is the game changer of everything. I mean, it's one thing to know that God loves us and, and wow, what a difference that makes. But if that God is impotent, if that God is weak, if that God is not uh, all uh, possessing all knowledge, if that God can't handle the world and history in our lives, then, you know, thank you for the love, but hey, you know, <laughs> so but when we say God is sovereign, it means that he is independent, he's free, he can do anything he wants to, and he's able. He is able. That's one of the big things that we know about God's sovereignty. Now, we've been talking about how God's sovereignty uh, impacts our lives, and we just covered one of those aspects last time. We're going to cover a couple more uh, this time that I think is going to be uh, an amazing encouragement to your life. Uh, we, last time we said that because God is sovereign, and this is kind of, base, kind of the base of the foundation here is God's sovereignty, because of that, uh, one of the benefits we get is that he can reign in our personal life and that actually he deserves to reign in our personal lives. You know, God has the right to rule over his creation. I mean, that sounds kind of simple and kind of logical, but you know, that's exactly right. God has the right, he deserves to have the, the number one place in my life, the, the top priority of my life. He deserves to sit on the throne of my heart. And it's a throne that's made for him. And when I get in it, you know, it feels natural because I have a sin nature, you know, but God says he's the one that, uh, that should be on that throne. So we talked about that. Let me give you a second great benefit of God being sovereign. And by the way, you want God to be sovereign in all these areas, okay? Here's the second one, is that God is also sovereign in our salvation, in our salvation. Hey, Jeff, what do you mean by that? Well, let's talk about that for just a few minutes. We go over to, to Ephesians uh, chapter, chapter 1, uh, verses 4 and 5. It says this. It says that in love, He, the Father, predestined us to adoption as sons. Now, that word predestined is a, a Greek compound word, pro, uh, pro orizo, means to, to foreordain or to determine beforehand. And this is, now, now we're stepping into the really the deep end of the pool here. Because, because God is timeless, the Bible says that he has existed in eternity past, before the foundation of the world. In other words, before Genesis 1-1, the beginning God created, God was there. I mean, without space, without time, without angels, without anything, God was just there. And the Bible says that while he was there, before anything was made, including us, it says that he decided to place his love on us towards salvation. And that's before we had done anything right, anything wrong. You know, obviously we know our salvation is not by works, but as before we had a chance to even exist, God made a decision. And this is part of his sovereignty. Remember, we, we define sovereignty as God being self-existent, independent of anything or anyone. So God can do whatever he wants to do, uh, except of course, sin, and betray his own nature. And so the Bible tells us clearly that God has foreordained us. He put his love on us way back before time began. Now, there's a lot of that that is confusing a little bit. There's a lot of that that is beyond our full understanding. And I get that. In fact, I, I wrote a whole chapter on this in my book, Uncovering the Mysteries of God. And really what it boils down to is two things. It boils down to us understanding who we are in the, in the order of things, in the grand order of things. Now, we are the crown of God's creation, right? Uh, but at the same time, we also know that, uh, that God is also sovereign. And so when we think about uh, God being sovereign in our salvation, we understand we don't deserve anything from God, but that he, if he wants to place his love on us, that's just an added benefit, right? And he does love us. But the second part of that we need to understand is that it's a divine romance. I mean, it says in love, in love. God is not some cold creator, uh, some, some great, you know, grand divine engineer that just kind of puts blocks, you know, in the universe kind of thing. No, he's, he is a loving creator. He's a loving God. And, you know, 
you and I just simply need to say, well, thank you. Thank you for that. Cause, cause we didn't have any, any influence over God making that decision. Uh, here's a couple of scriptures that you might want to jot down because this tells us that because we are sinners and that we're uh, dead in sin, that God had to make the first move towards us. You know, Jesus even told his disciples, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Uh, Jesus said, no man can come uh, to, uh, to, the, to me unless the Father draws him. But let me give you a couple of uh, scriptures that I think will be of a great encouragement to you. Number one is the one we just talked about, Ephesians 1.4. That's a great one to go look at. Uh, he set his heart of love on us before the foundation of the world. Uh, the Bible says in Colossians 3.12 and 1 Peter 2.9 and in John 15.16 that he chose us chronologically before we chose him. Now, we do choose God. We do um, possess, by God's grace, the ability to choose him, but we didn't initiate the relationship. And nobody, no matter where you are on the theological spectrum uh, in terms of, of, of Orthodox Christianity, Nobody will say that we initiated the process. God is always previous. God always uh, seeks us out. In fact, we just found out he sought us out all the way back in eternity past. But in time, we did make a decision, and that's required, by the way. You have to, the person has to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not an, a, a robotic kind of thing where God just programs you and then you do it. Uh, no, we actually have a, 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 a place in this process. And, you know, there's some divine mystery there and that's okay. It's okay for there to be some mystery there. But anyway, he, he chose us before we chose him. Uh, it says in 1 John 4, 19, he loved us before we loved him. It says we love him because he first loved us. That's a cause effect relationship there. The reason why we love this amazing God is because he is sovereign and he chose to love us first. In fact, when you think about uh, even the nation of Israel, I think it's in Deuteronomy 7, um, maybe verse 7 through 9, something like that. Uh, it's Well, let's just look it up here. i got my Old Testament. Why well, just uh, uh, flounder around with uh, the quote, and let's just find out what it is. Uh, Deuteronomy 7. Uh, here we go. Yeah, verse 7. It says, uh, The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you are more in number than any of the peoples. It says, uh, because you were the fewest of all people. Isn't that great that God doesn't say, Let's, who's the prettiest out there? Who's the smartest? Who's the most successful? Uh, who's the one that will produce the most, the most for me? Who, who's the one that, <coughs> excuse me, is, is the person that I think is, is the greatest? No, he looks for the few. He looks for the small. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says that not many of you, brethren, were wise. Not many of you were noble. I love uh, the um, uh, Adrian Rogers years ago. He used to say this. He says, you know, are, are you the smartest person at school? Are you the valedictorian? Are you the, the captain of the football team? Are, are you the, the richest kid uh, on the block? He said, guess what? God might be able to use you. But he says, I know that he can use other people because he uses so many ordinary people with just average skills. Uh, Abraham Lincoln even said, God must love ordinary people. He made so many of them, right? And so you and I, we're just ordinary people. There's nothing spectacular about me or about you. We're just people, right? But guess what? Even with Israel, God says, no, it wasn't because you were the greatest like the Egyptians or, you know, eventually the Assyrians or Babylonians. No, you were the fewest. But he says, but because the Lord loved you, and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you. Now, here's the thing. When you think about this, the, the promise God made to his forefathers was the promise God made to Abraham. And did Abraham initiate that relationship? No. Abraham was just hanging out and God came on and said, hey, go to a land you don't know where you're going to go. And, he, and then he said, hey, um, I want you to um, sacrifice your son. And then God says, I want to make a covenant with you and I want you to be my people and you're going to be the father of a great nation, Genesis 12, Genesis 15. Guess what? God in his sovereignty could have chosen an Egyptian or, or a, a Chinese or, or someone else. He chose Abraham, the father of the Jews, and God established a covenant relationship with Israel, with the nation Israel. 
And he still has that covenant today. They're on the back burner, Romans 11, uh, 25 and 26 tells us, but God still has this covenant with Israel he's going to make good on uh, in the last days. But, but here's the point. The point is even Israel's choosing by God wasn't because she was so great, it's just because God was so great. And that's, that's really the point. So he loved us before we loved him. Uh, also, Ephesians 2, uh, verses 1 through 5, uh, says that uh, God made us to be spiritually alive in him. He made us alive in him. Why did he do that? Well, because Ephesians 2 says, for you are dead in your trespasses and sins. That means that we have no spiritual life in us. We have life, but no spiritual life. We don't have a spiritual life that can relate to God. Uh, we are darkened in our understanding, the Bible says, that uh, we, we can't understand God. The 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 and 15 says that we're, we're natural men. And the natural man can't understand the things of the Spirit of God. And so guess what? God had to make us spiritually alive in Him. He had to regenerate our spirits uh, so that we could be enabled to trust in Him. Uh, John 6, 44, a verse I quoted earlier that uh, Jesus said, it actually says this twice in John 6, that no man can come to me, Jesus, unless the Father draws him. Now, we also know from John 16 that the Holy Spirit has a part in that too, that the Holy Spirit actually convicts us of sin. The reason you and I became Christians was not because we wised up one day or got smarter or decided our life sucked and we want to turn over a new leaf. No, it, it, spiritually speaking, it was because the Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and, God's, and, and of, of God's righteousness, persuades us of God's righteousness and of judgment. So we have a conviction that helps us understand that we need a Savior. Who did that? Well, the Holy Spirit did that. And then Jesus said the Father did that. So we have the, the whole Trinity working together on this. But God essentially romanced us to his Son for salvation. And I don't know what path that took in your life. I mean, maybe it was early on for you. Maybe you didn't really feel that romance. Maybe you just kind of came to this conclusion because of God convicting you that you needed a Savior. Maybe you didn't want to go to hell. Maybe you uh, understood that you had a bad heart. Uh, one of my sons uh, came to Christ at age five because he pushed his little brother uh, off the bed and uh, saw the consequences to that. He heard his brother. He came crying into my bedroom saying, Daddy, what's wrong with me? I want a new heart. And I was able to, to get him up in my lap and show him the plan of salvation. He trusted in Jesus, and he's walking with Jesus today, um, some 28 years later or so. But here's the point. Uh, the, the point is, is that uh, all of us have a story of how God romanced us. Sometimes he, he caused us to understand how deeply our sin problem was. Sometimes uh, our lives really did come apart, and we realize that we're at the bottom of the barrel, the bottom of the bucket. And there's nowhere to look but up. <laughs> and so we looked up and said, Lord, help. And guess what? He did. Because the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God romanced us to salvation. And then let me give you two more verses here. Um, in verse uh, ch chapter 1 of John, uh, verses uh, 12 and 13, John says that to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of the will of man, uh, nor, nor of their own desires, but of God. And what that verse, those verses tell us is that we didn't just simply will ourselves into salvation. We didn't simply say, oh, I'm going to work up this strength and I'm going to become saved. No, it doesn't work like that. It says that God is the one who causes us to be saved. I mean, you remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you're saved through faith. And even that's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not as a result of any works, lest any man should boast. If I could point to just one thing, where is it? One thing that I could credit for my salvation that I did, then I could boast about it. But you know what? All of my boasting, all of my bragging, all of my pride of my salvation is found in God. You know why? Because he started it. He progressed it by romancing me. He saved me. And now he's completing my salvation. Philippians 1, 6, for I'm confident that he who began a good work and you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Do you see how airtight your salvation is? It began in eternity past and it's never going to end. And that's just the beauty of God. And that's why uh, Psalm 3, 8 
says salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord, Psalm 3.8. And what that basically means is it's his to give to whomever he desires. Now he's offering it. Uh, it, the offer goes out to the world. We know everybody won't accept that. But we know that God is the one who has to be in charge of that. So that's God's sovereignty, even in our own salvation. And perhaps you didn't know that about yourself. Uh, perhaps you didn't know that about God. Maybe you didn't know that's how God brought you to himself because he had made a decision to do it uh, somewhere in the past. But, you know, when you and I step into heaven, there's going to be a whole lot of thanksgiving, a whole lot of praise, a whole lot of adoration, a whole lot of wow. And it's all going to be directed towards him. And there's not one person in heaven that pats themselves on the back and says, good job, boy. Good job, little girl. You got saved. I'm proud of you. No, none of that. It's all going to be directed towards Jesus. So God is sovereign uh, in our personal life. He's sovereign in our salvation. Let me give you another area, a third benefit of this sovereignty is that God is sovereign even in our suffering, even in our suffering. Now, I want to go to Romans chapter 5 for just a minute and look at a couple of verses here uh, because I think this will really give us uh, insight uh, into this whole idea. Now, this is what the Bible says. It says, not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope and hope does not disappoint. It says, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts uh, through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, what that verse is saying is that when you and I suffer, it's not for nothing. That's what it's saying. Some people suffer and they just suffer. They, you know, I see people all the time that just they're leading miserable lives and they're just suffering, but their suffering's not leading to anything. It's only leading to more suffering. It's only leading to more pain, more despair and more depression, more anxiety. You know, th that's not what God has for you. God says your suffering leads to character and perseverance. God is building something in you, only a sovereign God can turn suffering uh, into glory. Only a sovereign God can transform the, all the bad things that have happened to you into a beautiful tapestry that portrays this wonderful picture of God's story in your life and of the character of God. So when you and I go through suffering, God allows that because he wants to build perseverance. Why? because you need perseverance. You know why? Because it's a long race we're running here. Uh, this is not a, a sprint, it's a marathon. And God wants us to run that race with perseverance, to hang in there, to not give up, to not give up. So think about this. The next time you go through something hard, maybe something minor, maybe something big, no matter what, and everything in between, God is saying, I'm, I'm allowing this so that you can have the strength in the long run to handle what life is going to bring to you. So perseverance says builds character and character builds hope. How does it do that? Well, when we know that we're growing in Christ and, and becoming more like Jesus, that gives me the hope that my salvation is going to be complete one day, that I'm going to make it all the way to Christ likeness. That's the hope uh, that we have. And it says hope does not disappoint. And so how do we look at, at suffering like that? Well, we look at it because God says that uh, that I'm going to do something in you through it. So nothing you go through that is hard is in vain. Everything will count. And that's, you know, then we get to Romans 8, 28. We love this verse, don't we? And we know, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good. But for who? To those who are the called according to his purpose. Those who love God, who are the call according to his purpose. So that's a great verse, but guess what? Once again, only a sovereign God can, can turn tragedy into triumph. Only a sovereign God can help us in our suffering. Only a sovereign God can give us hope because we know that whatever happens to us did not take God by surprise. Took us by surprise. You know, we got, get blindsided by hard times, to be honest. I mean, this word tribulation, the, the Greek word thlipsis means, uh, means pressure. We, we go under pressure, you know, that, that, that life just kind of presses in on us. And, and so we experience these uh, tribulations, but when we suffer, 
excuse me, when we suffer, we know that number one, uh, God didn't take him by surprise. And, and secondly, we know God's still in control. That none of this suffering is outside of God's power uh, or control. So nothing takes him by surprise, not even your personal drama, your problems. Uh, you can know that God is still on the throne. He's going to work it in to something good to make you uh, into Jesus Christ. In fact, that's the very next verse after Romans 8, 28. It says that he predestined us uh, to be conformed to the image of his son. So again, ultimately, uh, the, the troubles and the trials and tribulations that you and I go through, the, the end goal is that we might be more like Jesus. So that's one thing maybe we could ask ourselves when we go through hard times. Am I becoming more like Jesus in this thing? Now, not denying what you feel, because what did Christ do when he went through great tribulation in the garden? He poured out his heart to the Father. This is a great point, because when you, you and I go through hard times, God's not asking you to just say, oh, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's fine. You know, God, God's in control, I'm fine. No, it, it involves us being honest with God and even Jesus Christ asked God, hey, is there any other way we can do this? I mean, if, this, if it's possible, take this cup away from me. I've prayed that. I've gone through difficult times. I said, God, take this cup away from me. I don't like drinking this cup. And God's saying, you need to drink it because it's going to make you more like my son. And Jesus persevered. Jesus had character. You know why? Because Jesus had hope. What was Jesus' hope in the garden? Well, Hebrews 12 tells us this, verses 1 through 3 says, Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising all the shame that was associated with it, and now he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Jesus looked ahead and saw what was coming after the suffering, which was character and perseverance and hope, and ultimately God exalting him. And so God will exalt us at the proper time. Uh, Peter tells us. So uh, that's, that's just an amazing lesson that we can learn there. Let me give you a fourth benefit here uh, about this uh, great sovereignty of God. Is that uh, fourthly, he rules even over our sin and our failures. He even rules over our sin and our failures. Now, this is, this is to me, one of the most amazing things about the sovereignty of God. Is that God takes even our our dry seasons, our moral defeats, our sins, um, our shortcomings, our failures, our sins of omission, sins of commission. He takes all those things and amazingly weaves that into the greater narrative and the greater purpose and story that he's writing in our lives. Only God can do that. Uh, only God can transform our moral defeats into victories and turn our stumbling blocks into stepping stones uh, to becoming more like Jesus. Now consider for a second, you know, that you've you failed God for the millionth time, and how's God going to respond to that? Well, let's look at what God did with some of these people in Scripture. How about Moses? Uh, we could call him Moses the murderer. Have you ever murdered anybody? I mean, in cold blood? I mean, just like spilt their blood and killed them and then ran and became a fugitive from justice? Anybody? No, but Paul did. I mean, excuse me, uh, Moses did. <laughs> Moses killed. Actually, Paul was a murderer too uh, in, uh, in Acts chapter uh, 7. Uh, but but uh, in, uh, in Moses' case, because of God's work in his life, he bounced back from being a cold-blooded murderer, <coughs> excuse me, and he started his life over again at age 80. Hello? I mean, is never too late? How about, are you 80 yet? Well, if you're 80, you can still start over. I, I suspect you can start over at 90 if you wanted to. Um, but he became the greatest leader the nation of Israel has ever had. Okay, so he went from being a complete loser and on the backside of the wilderness in Midian, tended a bunch of stinky sheep to being the leader of Israel. <clears throat> How about David? David the adulterer. Uh, David lied. David committed adultery. David even had a man murdered, right? Right? But David repented and renewed his pursuit of the Lord. And he is the only person in the whole Bible of which God says, of whom God says, he is a man after my own heart. God's sovereignty overcame his sin in the long run. Let me give you another one. How about Peter the coward? Peter the coward. The Bible says that he denied the Lord three times, 
publicly, again, anybody, have you ever done that? Have you ever stood up in your office or in your classroom at school or in your neighborhood and say, hey, everybody, I don't know Jesus. I don't know why you guys think I'm a Christian. I don't know Jesus. I don't want to know him. Have you ever done that? That's what Peter did. And he was a guy who walked with Jesus physically, and he still denied him. He saw the miracles. Well, surely God's going to just toss him to the ash heap of biblical history, right? No. The Bible says that this sin, which, by the way, would devastate most of us, right? Because it'd be all over social media. So imagine that. You denied Jesus on a video and it went viral. That's the equivalent. All right, but watch this. Because of Jesus' resurrection, Peter realized that this man he was following really was the Son of God. He was the sovereign God. And so Peter made a dramatic turnaround. He went on to become the primary leader of the early church. And he preached his famous sermon at Pentecost and 3,000 people were saved. Now that's a comeback we can believe in, right? Uh, that's coming down from being 40 points down at half and you came back and you won the game. Only a sovereign God can do that through your life. Uh, Peter went on, uh, tradition tells us that he was martyred for his faith in Jesus Christ. And it says, a uh, tradition says that he said to his, his captors uh, and his, uh, those who would execute him, he said, look, I can't, you can't crucify me like Jesus was crucified. I am unworthy to be even in the same physical place on the cross that Jesus was. Turn me upside down. And so the Bible, uh, excuse me, tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down for his faith. Are you beginning to get the idea that God actually might be for you <laughs> and that his sovereignty uh, might be amazing? Well, uh, when we suffer and when we go through hard times, uh, we can rest assured that even in our sin, that God will be sovereign. I love what Romans 8, uh, 31 and 32 says. It says, what then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He to who did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. If God's rule is not threatened by our suffering and our sin, why should we fear? Why should we worry? He has bound himself to us. Uh, and nobody can possibly uh, take that away. No hardship imaginable can ever disconnect you uh, from him. No sin too bad, no failure too great or frequent, no power too strong. So God is sovereign in our hearts. He's sovereign in our salvation. He's sovereign in our suffering, and he's sovereign even over our sin. And at the end of this Isaiah 40 passage, well, actually not the end, but right towards the end, uh, he pauses and God asks Isaiah, who is like me? Who is like me? He says, and to whom will you compare me? God is shouting to the earth and he's shouting to you and I today. You know anybody like me? Do you know anybody who would ever do, who could ever do all these things for you? I didn't think so. That's because God says, I am. I am. And you can trust me. Well, we're going to pick it up next time in Isaiah to talk about God's incredible righteousness and what a great effect that has on our lives as well. Hey, hop on over to jeffkinley.com. There's some great things going on in the ministry right now you're going to want to know about. And uh, God is doing some uh, really amazing stuff. And I'm just glad to be a part of it. Uh, thanks for joining me in this little series. We'll continue it next time on Divinity Truth.